Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our Monty Hart lecture series on clinical and imaging cardiology. Uh, we're starting this new academic year today, and we are starting with someone that we're very lucky to have as a speaker, Dr. Bene Bullock Palmer, who is the uh, Dr. Palmer is the director of the non invasive cardiac imaging and director of the Women's Heart Center at Deborah Heart and Lung Center in New Jersey. She's a clinical associate professor in the Department of Medicine and Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. She's a multimodality imaging expert. Her other areas of interest include women's uh, uh, heart health, cardiac amyloidosis, and adult congenital heart disease. She's board certified in adult congenital heart disease, cardiovascular medicine, internal medicine, cardiovascular CT, and nuclear, and ECHO. She's a real multimodality imager. Dr. Palmer is also the governor-elect of the New Jersey chapter of the American College of Cardiology and the president of the board of the Southern New Jersey AHA. She's also in the board of directors of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology and on the editorial board of Circulation Cardiovascular Imaging. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Palmer here today. She will be talking about adult congenital heart disease, management guidelines, and the role of cardiac CT. Thank you so much for joining us. Great. Thank you, Dr. Slipshek, for that wonderful um, introduction and for the kind invitation. So, like I said, um, he said that you know, we're going to be speaking on adult congenital heart disease, and we're going to be going through the role of cardiac CT. And a lot of uh, what I'll be going through will be case-based as well, and then we'll also have a few, um, a touch on a few of the guidelines. So just the goals and objectives is to outline the general principles for radiation dose reduction in cardiac CT for ACHD, and describing the best practices in performing CT in, in these patients, and review of, of appropriate use criteria for CT in ACHD management with inclusion of some case examples. So what are some of the reasons where, um, or some of the um, places where cardiac CT may be useful in these patients? So particularly um, for institutions that may have limited access to cardiac MRI for multiple reasons, is either um, lack of just having a um, you know, board certified reader who is equipped and able to read these studies or lack of equipment. Um, sometimes uh, as uh, for us in our area where we are in New Jersey, we do take a, a care of a lot of underserved patients. Sometimes there are insurance issues. So the, these are some of the areas, um, patients where a cardiac CT might be useful. Um, sometimes these patients may have uh, cardiac prosthetic material that are not MRI compatible, um, although some of that is changing with the newer MRI cameras, but we still encounter these patients. And sometimes it's not only being MRI compatible, but you have to ask yourself, uh, you know, does the presence of some of this prosthetic material inhibit having good diagnostic images to adequately see the pathology that you need to see? Um, some patients may have claustrophobia and uh, they find, um, you know, cardiac CT might be more comfortable with them. I had a patient recently like that. Um, we offered her both choices and she really did not wish to undergo the MRI because of her significant claustrophobia and were able to do this study on CT. Um, in some cases, when you're looking at a detailed um, you know, areas of the heart, spatial resolution for CT is much higher than CMR, particularly when you're looking for vascular stents, uh, pulmonary artery stents. Um, there are certain, certain patients where we may have to consider percutaneous uh, pulmonary valve replacement. There are certain measurements that might be required by the vendors that they do prefer CT in these patients. So in terms of the general principles, I'll refer you to table 18 in um, the SCCT guidelines, the 2015 guidelines on ACHD. And one of the things, this is actually a very important document if you're considering doing CT for these patients. It's very comprehensive. Um, there's a part one and part two. And this is just some of the areas in which we can um, you know, use to reduce or dose um, that we, you know, expose our patients to. Certainly not all cases have to have gated images, especially if you're just looking at the pulmonary veins. Sometimes they may be able to just do a flash acquisition, um, single, single beat study. And then there are other times where you really need that detail and you need to have the gated images. So just being very mindful of um, the radiation exposure and try to be as low as reasonable achiever, achievable, the lower principle for these patients. <laughs> 
Now, there are several scan sequences that we can choose for cardiac CT, um, as is shown here. And um, these range from the retrospective gated study, where the gated images are acquired throughout the entire cardiac cycle for multiple cycles with the same radiation dose, exposure, and current. Uh, and this, um, then there is a ret retrospective gating with dose modulation that acquires the images throughout the entire cardiac cycle for multiple cycles with the radiation dose um, lowered during systole and is it higher in diastole? And then there's a prospective gated study that acquires the images only in diastole in multiple cardiac cycles. And uh, therefore the reduction uh, radiation dose decreases as you move from the retrospective gating, then retrospective gating with dose modulation. And of course the prospective gating has um, a very low radiation exposure. Then, you know, lately we have a high pitch helical study, which is uh, the lowest radiation dose with these patients, where it's a single bead acquisition. And with these patients, you can get as low as less than one millisievert exposure for these patients. In terms of injection protocols, that's another important area that you have to consider. Um, there are two main types of inje contrast injection protocols used in CT. There's a biphasic injection protocol that is performed when the injection of contrast followed by saline. And this is used primarily when you're looking at the left-sided structures as well as the coronary arteries. Now, oftentimes for congenital heart disease, we really need to know what's going on on the right side of the heart, especially if you have congen um, if you have corrected, uh, sorry, transposition of the great arteries, DTGA, and other pathologists, the trials drift below. And in these patients, triphasic injection pr um, protocol is performed, where the injection of contrast is performed, is done first, followed by a mixture of contrast and saline, followed by an injection of saline. And this, as I mentioned, is utilized when you're looking at the right and left side of the heart. And um, oftentimes, this is a protocol that we use quite a bit for congenital cases. So there are, four, um, there are four areas that we need to consider when we're um, scanning these patients. There is a patient preparation, which starts um, before the scan. And oftentimes, you know, when these patients are referred to us for imaging, you know, I'd like to review these at least a few days before the, the patient is scheduled where we can try to get the operative report if it's available and the previous um, imaging reports that might be available, even sometimes getting the images that may have been performed previously so that you have a direct comparison when you're reading the study and um, really preparing the patient for the study. So um, beta blocker use for, uh, for these cases. Um, being very mindful though that some of these patients have very complex congenital heart disease. So you certainly wanna avoid any hypotension. Um, so you have to be very careful about the dose of the, of the beta blocker and um, trying to get them prepared before the scan. Um, sometimes um, if they're very claustrophobic, we may also um, give them, you know, pre-treat them with Xanax, of course, with the understanding that there's someone that's driving them to and from the appointment. Then the, the second thing is the scan range. We want to make sure that we have in, um, have in the field of view all of the structures that we'd like to uh, look at. Um, certainly, if the patient has have had any um, you know anastomoses and, and stuff where we have to assess from the aortic um, arch all the way down to the diaphragm. Um, so, so that's very important. If we're just looking at the pulmonary veins, when we decrease our field of view in the scan range, um, this, the scan sequence is another uh, very important thing to discuss. As we mentioned, retrospective versus prospective, single beat acquisition, and then the contrast acquisition timing. So these are the four areas that we really, you really want to um, consider and review before the, the day of the scan. I'll also refer you to some two important documents as well. These, this is the, as I mentioned, the SCCT expert consensus document that was published in 2015. And more recently in 2020, there was a multi-society AUC document for multimodality imaging during the follow-up of ACHD patients. And very important if you're taking care of these patients in the clinic, knowing when um, to refer these patients for imaging and the type of imaging that you select for these patients. So um, in addition to that, uh, in terms of management uh, of these patients, uh, there's a 2018 HA ACC uh, management guidelines. And in this guideline um, document, CT had a class 2A recommendation level of evidence C when the information that cannot be obtained by another diagnostic modality is important enough to justify exposure to ionizing uh, radiation. Now, in terms of um, assessing and classifying these ACHE patients, you have to consider the anatomy and then the physiologic uh, stage. Um, so, of course, the anatomy may be simple, such as a simple ASD, 
or moderate complexity. And then there's a great complexity where you have patients with the Norwood procedure, Fontan, um, you know, Fontan circulation. Then there's a physiologic stage, which is really a functional class of what the patient's um, ability physically, um, whereas in your heart association class one, where there's no hemodynamic sequelae, or, and that moves all the way down to um, functional class four with severe hypoxemia or cyanosis. Oftentimes in patients with Fontan repair, with Fontan physiology, these patients are living at an O2 of 88%. Um, they may have you know, baseline cyanosis. So these patients are at a higher clinical risk uh, compared to those patients in um, stage in class one. In terms of looking and comparing the different imaging modalities and radiation exposure, relative cost, ventricular volumes. So CT um, is very useful for looking at the course uh, of, coron of the coronary artery anatomy, as we all know, looking at extra cardiac vascular anatomy as well, and looking at, at stents and so on. Um, we also sometimes use it for, for assessment of um, ventricular volumes. We have found it very useful, especially if you have a very good quality study. Um, it's not as, um, may not be as accurate as uh, cardiac MRI, but it comes close to it. So we sometimes, especially if the patient doesn't have um, very good echo windows and um, we're not able to get an MRI on these patients. And this is just an example of that where we have um, on the left, uh, the basically RV and left ventricular function, and you can actually get LB volumes, LB size, and um, LB ejection fraction. Now, CT is also recommended um, in patients uh, with um, co coarctation of the aorta, even after surgical or catheter intervention. Uh, and this should be done, um, these patients should be assessed, you know, on a regular basis with a CMR CT at least um, every 36 months. Um, if they're stage A, definitely if they're stage D, um, you're looking at every 12 to 24 months. And the reason for that is because these patients can have re at the site of repair. And you certainly not want to miss this, especially if these patients uh, become hypertensive. Other things that can um, you have to also look out for is um, aneurysms and aortic aneurysms for these patients. So CT is very useful in that area. Um, if they've had a stent, um, CT might be more useful than CMR, but certainly if you do have CMR and they do not have any um, contraindications, then that's actually more helpful. Now, in terms of looking at anomalous pulmonary venous connections, um, CMR CT also has a class one recommendation for that. And the importance for this is that, especially if you're having, you know, reading echoes and you have a patient with a massively dilated right ventricle, right atrium, and you're not seeing any obvious into, you know, atrial atri 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 septal defects, ventricular septal defects. One of the important things that you want to make sure that you do not miss is, is a sinus venosis ASD. And oftentimes in these patients with sinus venosis ASD, they can have anomalous, partial anomalous pulmonary venous connections. So that's the importance of looking at cross-sectional uh, imaging with CMR or CT to look for this. And this is just an example of that where this patient actually had a sinus venosis ASD repair. And um, you can see here, um, as is as shown here, that there, there was a repair there. And this patient actually also had partial anomalous pulmonary venous return of the right um, upper and lower pulmonary veins into the right atrium. And this is a post-surgical um, study. So the um, right, the right lower pulmonary vein and right upper pulmonary veins were baffled over back to the left atrium after the ASD was closed. This is another case that actually quite interesting. He presented to us in his um, 60s after having had, um, you know, carrying a diagnosis of what was thought to be, you know, primary pulmonary hypertension. And he had significant clubbing cyanosis was actually on home oxygen. And he presented to another hospital with a stroke and they did an, um, an echocardiogram and thought they had seen a PFO. And, you know, he was referred to us here. We actually did a TEE and he was found to have uh, quite interesting um, findings where I'll show you here that he, they had, what was seen here where the right lower pulmonary vein was actually entering into the IVC and the IVC then shuffled over into the left atrium communicating. So this patient actually had a sinus venosis ASD with anomalous pulmonary venous return of the right um, lower pulmonary vein. And we can see that vein coming in here into the IVC 
and the IVC um, shunting that blood over into the left atrium. So quite um, interesting. He was actually referred to um, an adult um, congenital heart disease surgeon where he had ASD repaired and had the baffled, um, baffling of that right lower corner vein over back to the left atrium. And interestingly, he also had a right middle corner vein as well, which is a normal variant. Um, so you have the right upper, the right middle, and then that right lower, and you can see that shunting here coming over from the um, from the so the IBC over to the um, communicating. And this is just a, a, a snapshot of his um, RV and his LD. His RV was actually dilated. Um, it was at this point close to 300 um, cc's on the end diastolic volume. His EF was 44%, so massively dilated right ventricle, which um, indicated the need to have that closed. And he actually had um, had the surgery over the summer and is now off home oxygen and is feeling much better, less short of breath. So it's, it's interesting with this particular patient because he presented so late, but, you know, um, don't forget to look for these cases. They often come in either through the pulmonary clinic because they're having this primary hypertension no one can explain, or the echo lab where we're seeing these massively dilated right ventricle and right atrium, and then, by the way, had a TE and then found a pathology. So um, really, you have to look out for these patients. Um, you know, if you don't think about it, you may miss it. Now, moving on to tetralogy of flow, um, the, in, 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 on our side in the adult clinic, these patients oftentimes present to us um, as with symptoms and sequelae of their repair, where um, in, in adulthood, they may have significant pulmonary um, valve insufficiency. Uh, they may also have pulmonary valve um, stenosis if they've had valve neuroplasty. And then later on in life, they may end up having either supervalvular stenosis more often. Um, th these patients can also have pulmonary artery dilation. They can also have branch pulmonary sten artery stenosis. So these are some of the um, complications that can arise in adulthood and, uh, and present to us um, in the imaging lab. And this is an example of a patient who had tetralogy of flow, and we can see that the RV is massively dilated. And this patient actually had um, significant pulmonary valve insufficiency. Right, this one. Let me go back here. Right, so the patient actually had um, presented to the echo lab with severe pulmonary valve insufficiency and was referred to us for um, basically the harmony valve protocol, looking to see the measurements to see this patient could have percutaneous replacement of the pulmonary valve. And one of the things that you also have to be very mindful of is not just the sizing of the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary valve analyst, but you have to also look to see where the left main or the LED is in reference to the pulmonary artery and then the distance from the pulmonary valve analyst because that has implications for the, the type of valve that they'll be putting into this patient and also this, um, the size of the valve as well. And this patient actually ended up having um, the replacement of the pulmonary valve, as is seen here, the tissue valve. And you can see the leaflets are moving well, no significant pulmonary valve insufficiency. And then this is just a snapshot of another case of a tetralogy of follow patient where this patient actually developed supervalvular stenosis, very tight stenosis, as is seen here, and also um, on the cross sectional here and in another view here as well. And this patient actually had to be referred for um, replacement with a pulmonary valve conduit for this uh, stenosis. Patient presented with syncope and, um, and had to be referred for replacement. Now, recently I had a patient in the clinic that I saw over the summer. Um, she had presented to us with uh, distant exertion, reduced functional capacity. And what we, one of the things with CT is that we tend, especially if we're looking for, for stenosis or thrombosis, after we do the initial arterial phase scan, we'll do a delayed phase scan. And this is just an example of that, a snapshot of that. And what this patient actually had was um, the, the conduit that she had. She had a tetralogy of flow repair, and then she had a pulmonary artery valve conduit that was placed um, in, in early childhood. And uh, what tends to happen with these patients over time 
is that the conduit can become heavily calcified, can become stenosed. And if you see here, they, this is actually um, the view of the pulmonic valve. And you can see that there is some filling defect here in this area. And you can see it in the cross-sectional view. And on the other slide here, you see a very close-up of that, where um, it's quite um, stenosed here. And this is all filled with um, sclerotic material or sclerotic material from the valve over time. So she was actually referred um, for um, surgery, ACHD surgery, to have a placement of that valve conduit to relieve um, the, the stenosis. And on the echocardiogram, the mean gradient of that pulmonary outflow is actually 50 millimeters of mercury, so it was quite high um, and definitely severely stenotic. So another form of congenital disease that we can see and utilize CT4 is a double outlet right ventricle, um, DORV. And so heart disease is that 10% that from birth and usually present, presents at birth. And what happens here is that the aorta is connected to the right ventricle instead of to the left ventricle. And both the coronary artery and the aorta rises from the right ventricle. Um, so in other words, the LV does not have any connecting um, you know, arteries coming from there. And the, the VSD, these patients depend on a VSD to survive, right? Because you have to have that mixed of blood over into the LV because there's no outflow of the LV. So there are four main variants. There's a tetralogy of a little type variant where there's a subaortic VSD and pulmonary valve stenosis. Then there's a TGA type variant where you have the DRV with subpulmonary VSD, but with no um, pulmonary stenosis. And uh, this is also known as a toxic Bing anomaly. And then there's a, there's a VSD type variant where you have the DORV with subaortic VSD, but without any pulmonary valve stenosis. And then these, the um, more complex type is the univentricular heart type variant, where you have mitral atresia and having an unbalanced um, atrioventricular septal defect. And these patients have significant hypoplasia of either the left or the right ventricle. So there are several complications that can happen in adulthood in the tetralogy below type DRB with a subaortic VSD and pulmonary valve stenosis. These patients present uh, light tetralogy below, except that the VSD closure is done by creating a tunnel rather than a VSD patch. And postoperatively, these patients can either present with residual VSD um, or residual um, or recurrent pulmonary artery stenosis. And definitely pulmonary artery, um, pulmonary valve insufficiency can also be seen. Um, if the branch pulmonary arteries are severely hypoplastic, um, then the preferred treatment method is usually an early, pa early palliation of systemic to pulmonary artery shunting, um, followed by definitive repair later on in, in um, childhood. The rest study procedure is another procedure that, that, that can be done in this condition where you have the closure of the VSD um, patch, and then you have the um, connection of the aorta to the LV and the pulmonary artery to the RV. And this is an example of a um, DRV case, and we're just moving through the images here. And you can see as we get into the, uh, the aorta, the pulmonary artery is severely dilated in this case. And the infundibulum, which is coming up next here in the image, is also significantly dilated. And you can see with the triphasic injection protocol, we, we are having quite good opacification on the right side of the heart. And that RV is massively dilated in addition to the right atrium. And this patient actually ended up having quite a bit of pulmonary valve insufficiency and had to be referred for uh, percutaneous pulmonary valve um, replacement. As you can see here, there's a D-shaped septum. The LV is slipper shaped uh, in, in, and much smaller in size than the RV, which is also, have, um, also hypertrophy. And this is just an example of the LV function and the RV function here. You can just see how dilated the RV function was quite reduced um, at 30%. It's just another view of that here. And the patient actually had to also have um, the ICD placement, because one of the things that you also have to be concerned, especially with pulmonary valve insufficiency and RV systolic uh, failure, is that they can develop uh, things such as uh, ventricular tachycardia, sudden cardiac arrest. So these patients um, usually 
in addition to doing the CT scan, we also have them do a pulse monitor to assess for any significant ventricular arrhythmias. So, um, you know, as, as these patients may end up having need, the need for defibrillator. And this patient went on to have um, pulmonary valve um, replacement, and there are certain measurements that we have to take, both the right, the right side pulmonary artery left um, were normal in size. Uh, we also looked at the sizing of the annulus as well as the pulmonary artery, and then the length and distance from the pulmonary valve annulus to the bifurcation of the pulmonary artery. That's also very important to measure that in systole and diastole, because prefer uh, preferably you'd like to not have any significant change in that distance, because um, that may also have implications as to the type of valve that is placed. And this is just uh, some other measurements that we had taken, like the distance from the, the left uh, main from the pulmonary artery, and you can see the annulus here as well. And in terms of the restella repair and, and indications for that, so in, in terms of following these patients as um, these, you know, with the RV to PA conduit, which is another um, form of repair for DORV, Usually these patients with either CMR or CT should be done every 36 to 60 months, either stage A, um, less um, you know, sick patients, but with the very sick stage D patients, at least every one to two years, we, these patients should be evaluated with cross-sectional imaging with CMR or CT to look for these complications, particularly um, where in as is shown in the um the, as I shown in, in another case, you can actually have um, the RV to P conduit being stenosed and, and having to be replaced. Now, moving on to DTGA, this is another form of um, congenital disease. And although, you know, with the surgical repair of these patients have switched to an arterial switch, uh, where the, the aorta and the pulmonary artery are transected and then placed back um, where they should be physiologically, um, oftentimes these patients, the older patients usually uh, patients in their 50s, 60s have been repaired with the atrial switch uh, procedure. And what happens with the atrial switch procedure is that you have baffling of the flow from the right atrium over to the right ventricle, right? And, um, and then baffling of, so over into the left ventricle, sorry, and then baffling of the left atrium over into the right ventricle because the right ventricle is serving as your systemic ventricle. And these patients can develop um, complications over time. They can develop either systemic or coronary venous baffle narrowing or leaks. They can develop RV failure, remembering now that the RV is a systemic ventricle. Um, they can develop subpulmonary, subpulmonary obstruction, um, especially when you're, they're shifting of that ventricular septum into the LVOT causing that um, pulmonary subpulmonary obstruction. Remember now that the LV is your sub subpulmonic ventricle in these patients. Um, the tricuspid valve can become um, insufficient and that is, the, the tricuspid valve is serving as a systemic atrioventricular valve. So when these patients start to have significant tricuspid valve insufficiency, you wanna make sure that you don't wait too long because if the RV starts to fail, then these patients may end up having you know, significant heart failure. So you really wanna refer these patients to fix that tricuspid valve before the RV starts to fail. Um, these patients may also develop heart block as well, which is um, quite common in these uh, patients. This is an example of a case that we had a patient with a DTG after an atrial switch. She had systemic RV systolic dysfunction. You can see that the RV is massively dilated and is serving as a systemic um, ventricle. The LV is a subpulmonic ventricle. And uh, as you can see here, the, the pulmonary veins, I think it had just shown here, the pulmonary veins are baffled here over into the, um, into the RV, which is your systemic ventricle and the SVC and IVC is baffled over into the left ventricle, which is a subpulmonic ventricle. And in these cases, the RV is heavily hypertrophied um, and quite large. And in the, um, as is shown here as well, the other findings is that in these patients, the aorta and the pulmonary artery lie in parallel to each other, which is a um, sign that we um, often look out for in echocardiograms to pick up this diagnosis. And in this case, in the DTGA form, the aorta lies anterior to the right of the pulmonary artery, whereas with the con congenitally corrected, um, it lies anterior to the left. And this is another patient where um, the patient had 
significant stenosis of the superior limb of the SVC baffle. So you can see in this, in this um, uh, cell frame that the patient actually has a lead into the SVC and there's really no flow into that SVC. And this patient was referred for stenting of the SVC. She had presented with symptoms of uh, facial swelling and um, as well as shortness of breath. And she had to have the explantation of that lead and then having a stent placed. That's not thing that you have to mental of in these uh, patients with DTGA because they can end up having baffle stenosis, putting in leads, especially um, transvenous leads. You have to really think of carefully because they can, they can end up having stenosis of that baffle as um, tissue goes around uh, those leads. So this is that same patient, and you can see that there is this is the SV, the IVC, the SVC, really no flow going into that um, to that SVC as well. And on, on the cardiac cath, she did have some mild um, stenosis of the IVC baffle, but the main pathology was that SVC stenosis. And uh, this is just the pulmonary vein is still frame, um, no stenosis there. Oftentimes with the pulmonary veins, what tends to happen is um, they can end up having a baffle leaks. So these patients may present with cyanosis. And, you know, the, the, another useful test to do on these patients is a cardiopulmonary, a, com a complete cardiopulmonary stress test, um, assessing their FiO2 and also their um, oxygen level, because sometimes they may, you know, during their daily activities, a lot of times these patients learn to restrict their activities to their ability. And you may, coming into the clinic, they'll tell you they feel fine, but then you put them on a treadmill and you realize that they become hypoxic and um, they, can barely, they can barely go two minutes on the treadmill. And so sometimes you, know, you may not pick up these leads until, unless you really look for it. And then when you refer them for the CT or MRI, um, you know, you're able to see the leads. Um, this patient didn't have any leaks, but we tend to also use TE quite heavily to look for leaks because sometimes the leaks may be missed on CT, um, but then you may pick it up on, on the uh, TEE, especially if it's a small leak. Now, um, with, with uh, use of CT with arterial switch, very important for these patients because what happens is in addition to, to transecting the aorta and the pulmonary artery and then putting them back to their rightful positions, the coronary arteries are also repositioned and that's where um, those patients can end up having stenosis of the osteo. And that can be missed if you're not looking for it. So these patients really should have um, a CT to look for, especially if they're coming in with chest pains. Chest pain, you wanna make sure to do, um, to look at the coronary artery anatomy, make sure that they're not having any osteal stenosis. Um, the, the coronary artery root and branch um, can become stenosed because what tends with the Lecomte procedure that these patients have where the coronary artery is repositioned and as is shown in the small frame here, um, wrapped almost around the aorta, you can end up having stenosis of the, of the branch coronary arteries here um, later on in adulthood. Um, sometimes the pulmonary artery, the pulmonary um, valve may become insufficient as well. They may also develop near aortic root dilation or stenosis. And as I had mentioned before, they can develop um, stenosis of the coronary osteo. So recommendations for these patients, um, CMR, CT, dependent on how sick the patient is, um, the more stable patient every 36 to 60 months, um, the sicker patients we're looking at every one to two years, to, um, to, to do these studies to look for any of these um, complications as well. Now looking to more complex disease, this is the LV hypoplastic syndrome. And this is actually the very, the most uh, complex I think things get with the ACG population. So basically what happens is that the LV is very diminutive, non-functioning, and you have a diminutive aorta as well. And this is usually occurred with a normal stage procedure which ultimately results in a single ventricle physiology. And there's a creation of the Fontan conduit where the IVC and the SVC empties into this Fontan conduit, which may either be extra cardiac or may be um, incorporating the right atrium as well. And the Fontan may be fenestrated or non-fenestrated and the left atrium and the right atrium functions as one large atrial conduit as there's an atrial septectomy that occurs and empties into the systemic RV and then into the reconstructed aorta. So it's a very complex um, surgery that's done in these patients, but the, the end result is um, what you're seeing here on the right, 
where, as I had mentioned, the SVC, the IBC empties into that extracardiac fontan and then empties into the pulmonary artery. And then because the LB is diminutive, it's not functioning, the RV takes over as a systemic ventricle and then um, pumps blood into the reconstructed aortic root. Um, complications in this group of patients, they can have quite a lot. Um, they can end up having, you know, pulmonary artery narrowing, um, the, the, either at the IBC to PA site or the SVC to PA site. The atria can become very dilated. Oftentimes, these patients have a lot of atrial um, arrhythmias, atrial tachycardia. Um, they can have systemic venous occlusion or venous venous collaterals, where there's a communication between the collaterals um, on the right side, mixing with the pulmonary venous flow. Um, these presenting with cyanosis. Within the fontan circulatory, uh, there can be clot formation because remember in these patients, what's happening is that there is no, um, there's no pump on the right side. So this is all st stasis, static, you know, or should not, shouldn't be static, but very sluggish blood flow. And these patients can end up having um, clotting or thrombosis into that fontan. They can also have over time um, heart failure because the RV is serving as a systemic ventricle and it's not made, it was not functionally, you know, anatomically made to sustain that pressure. So over time, the RV can become um, systolic, you know, systolic dysfunction leading to heart failure. They can also have baffle leaks and they can also have hepatic disease and hep hepatomas with hepatic um, carcinoma. So you have to also look for that as well when you're seeing these patients and plastic and bronchitis. Um, so CT, um, the, this group of patients are oftentimes very sick and oftentimes a CT or CMR is recommended every 24 to 36 months to look for these complications. And this is an example of, um, of one of our patients that we did here in our um, seat on in the CT suite. And you can see here that this is a Fontan conduit where you're seeing the SVC, the IVC, and that's now emptying into the pulmonary artery. This is a view of the, the veins, but this is just showing here the Fontan circuit. And the, the Fontan here was quite um, patent. We didn't see any obstruction of any blood flow. Um, and there are so, some, um, Suggestion there might be some collaterals here that we're seeing in superiorly. Then another view of that, um, so this is just another example here where you can see that the right atrium and left atrium serves as one large atrial conduit. And then this patient actually had um, a non fenestrated, uh, so, um, so the, the fontan flow is here. This is the atrial flow. So, of course, there is a closure here. Sometimes they may have to have this fenestrated, especially if there's a lot of high pressure in the right side system. And this serves as a pop-off valve. Um, but the, the risk of this, of course, is that if there's any clot in the fontan, if there's fenestration, these patients can end up having a stroke. Uh, in this particular patient, this was not fenestrated and you're not seeing any blood flow um, from the fontan into the left atrium. This is the right ventricle, which is serving as one, um, as a systemic ventricle, is quite large and dilated in this patient, and also um, so there's systolic dysfunction as well. And you can see here that this is the, our, the, the tricuspid valve, which is serving as a systemic atrioventricular valve, and then this blood then flows into the reconstructed aorta, as is shown here. So it's just um, another view of the pathology. And you can see the very diminutive aorta with the corner arteries as is seen here. Um, and then the, this is the reconstructed aorta that you're seeing. And this patient had quite a few collaterals. Um, so you're seeing these vessels here. These are all collateral flows. And, and, and even here, you can see that here as well. Um, so this patient was very sick, um, coming in with cyanosis. As a, he was a young gentleman, and uh, he, after he had the CT scan, he actually went on to have um, to have some interesting findings. And the reconstructed aorta in this particular patient as well. He also had some recortation, as we're seeing showing here uh, on that reconstructed aorta. So a lot of pathology for this one patient. And this is showing the collateral, venous, venous collateral. So what's happening here is that you're having this conglomerate um, of, of vessels here, the, which is which with uh, blue blood, this is for the corner artery. And then that's shunting um, that, on, uh, that, you know, basically um, blood from the right side over to the left side. And these patients are ending up presenting with sandals. This is another example of that. 
And uh, we were able to see this um, all with CT. So quite a lot of pathology for this uh, one patient. So he ended up going to the cath lab um, and they actually had done some coil um, in coil emboli they embolized the, the collaterals here to really close them. They couldn't get all of the collaterals because there were so many, so they got as many as they could get. And um, his, he actually did pretty well after the cardiac catheterization. His stenosis had decreased and um, his functional capacity had also improved as well. Um, this is a more recent case um, in the clinic of Fontana, young female, who in her case, she had tricuspid atresia and had a tab Fontan repair with an ASD MPAS closure of the fenestrated Fontan. So in her particular case, um, the RV was not functioning, right? Because the tricuspid valve was atretic, the RV was hypoplastic. So basically her Fontan uh, was created to due to the fact that she had no RV. So the SVC, IVC entered into the Fontan conduit. And then there was um, an amplast closure of, of, of the fenestration that she had. The amplast closure was placed later on in life, I think in her early teens. And she presented to me with syncope, um, exercise-induced hypoxia. And uh, interestingly, she actually was um, pregnant a year before coming to see me, but lost her pregnancy in early trimester. Um, and, you know, so that, that's one of the feared um, issues with, with these patients with Fontan because the pregnancy can be a fatal event for them because oftentimes the pathology cannot sustain the pregnancy. And we oftentimes ask these patients to avoid pregnancy. And, you know, contraception is very important for this group of patients. So she went on to have a CT. And this is just a still frame that I'm showing here. But she had very... Um, stenosed uh, spontan circuit. So this is actually, as any can compare this case to the case I had shown earlier, where the, the, this is the SVC, the IBC, and then this is the spontan, and this is also another view. And there's really no flow in, in this um, circuitry here. And um, we had concluded that the spontan was uh, stenosed. Um, she went on to have a, um, and this is just a still shot of the, of the LV and RV function. Her, um, her, function of the LV was actually quite good, which I think it's greater than 60%. So that was not her problem. The real problem was the fontan. So this is um, what was seen at the cath lab. There was um, stenosis of that fontan um, circuit. And then she ended up having stenting of that. And you can see that after the stent, it opened up nicely. And um, she actually had this done over the um, of this summer as well and did, did better. She still has, she's still having some palpitations, but she's no longer having any um, syncopal episodes. And her functional capacity, we had repeated her catacomonary stress test had improved after the procedure. So in summary, um, you know, there's, you know, they when performing cardiac CT, it's very important to have comprehensive pre-procedural planning. Um, it requires coordination between the referring team, um, the CT imager, and also the technologist. We really plan the scan ahead of time, looking at sequence, the scan range, the injection protocol, and really preparing the patient before days before coming in. Um, obtaining the prior operative reports is important, in, including previous imaging studies that have been done. And as I, I had shown, you know, CT can provide assessment, not just for coronary anomalies, but also vascular stents and also other pathologies. And, you know, we can really utilize CT to see quite a lot of pathology and really make some important diagnoses for patients to really help them um, to improve their, their um, clinical outcomes. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a wonderful lecture. It's a great honor to have you here to start, you know, this year again. And uh, Thank you so everyone for, for being. We had great attendance. Uh, please put your questions in the Q&A and, and we'll go through them. Uh, I'll start with one question. It's a little bit more technical, but how you, you plan these, these cases before. Do you, how do you decide between uh, time bolus versus bolus tracking? Do you use always the same or do you, do you change? Right. So um, we tend to do bolus tracking rather than time bolus because sometimes with the pathology that these patients have, the timing might be off. So we do a bolus tracking um, protocol for these patients. 
And uh, with regards to the 60 second delay, I think someone is asking, um, you know, with regards to using that. I found the 60 second delay very helpful. Um, there are times in the front hand circuit uh, patients, I think the case I showed was a 60 second delay, but I've used up to 90 seconds, um, you know, in, in terms of looking to see if there's any thrombus or clots. Um, how do I choose between 60 and 90? Um, really, that they, if the patient has any underlying um, heart failure, that RV systolic dysfunction, I may choose a longer uh, delay, like 90 seconds. Uh, but I do find that the, the, actually they had mentioned this at this the SCCT workshop all over the summer that a delay scan can actually make quite a big a, a bit of difference trying to make a decision whether or not there's thrombosis or if what you're seeing is just um, switching off the contrast in, in the circuitry. That's, uh, that's very important. Yeah, the, Daniel Lorenzati, one of our visiting faculty here, has uh, had that question, how to image the Glenn versus Fontaine conduits with the delay. So right. thank you that's very awesome. much. Uh, next question we have here is uh, from Wakas uh, Hanif. Uh, he says, usually in congenital cases, as you mentioned, MRIs prefer over CT due to radiation. But in what circumstances, you mentioned some, in what circumstances you would choose CT over MRI? Right, so I think, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of prosthetic material, especially if there, if there's a stent in, like, let's say that the case I showed with the pulmonary artery, if there's a vascular stent, there's really hard to use MRI because then you have a lot of that artifact that can, that can prevent you from really getting those measurements. Um, so, you know, I'm definitely the MRI, if you have, you know, cardiac MRI, and that's not just having the MRI, but having someone to read the studies because you have to have those two things in place to really, um, you know, get get what you need from 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 the study. So, if there's a lack of either of those, I would, and you know, you have CT and have someone able to read those studies, and I would heavily weigh more towards CT. Um, but if you have a very robust MRI program, congenital reader, then that for sure MRI is useful and also avoids radiation. Um, so that's that's how I would approach that. No, that's key. And I think many times, you know, in, in, in meetings and stuff, I mean, we, we focus on in the ideal world, but adapting this to each side, I think, like you're saying, is so important. Um, so, so thank you. And when you have, a, you, you were talking about the burden of prosthetic material that you have. Uh, when you have a lot of that, do you, do you choose, uh, do you increase your KB to 120, even that you're trying to reduce radiation or you use scan always at the same KV or, or use a scanner automatic? How, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so we, we actually have um, with the som somatom Siemens um, that we have, they, they, the camera itself depends on the patient's weight will dial down the KV and also the current. Um, so that's that's adaptable and customizable to the patient. Um, if I do have the sense, though, I will tend to use a lower KV um, and, you know, to, to avoid any artifacts. Okay, thank you, thank you. So the uh, question from Daniel, <clears throat> Daniel Lorenzati, great quality images, uh, truly, they were wonderful. It seems that you use heavy ECG dose modulation acquisition for your retrospective scans. Could you comment further on the protocol and scanner use? Is that a somaton force? Right. So that, that's what we use, the semen somaton force. And, um, you know, the protocol we, we tend to use, as I mentioned, we, we do retrospective gating and um, if, if I'm not really looking at any detailed anatomy, I, I'll do with dose modulation um, for these cases. And what, what has helped a lot is the triphasic injection protocol and really making sure you have good opacification on both the LV and RV. Um, there are times like, I think, once, uh, you know, the one, there's one case I can remember in the past um, three or four years where we did the triphasic injection protocol, but for some reason, the timing was not correct. And we, we almost had, we actually had to repeat the scan a couple of years later, but um, the, that triphasic injection is very useful. Um, but, you know, I, I don't want to give the impression that all congenital cases have to be retrospective gated. They certainly don't have to be. If you're looking just for Corner venous anatomy or something with less detailing, you do not need the ventricular volumes, um, then you can definitely do a prospective um, study without the gating. As a matter of fact, I think, um, you know, the, I, I can speak, I think Kelly Han at SCCT, she images a lot of infants and toddlers, and they have even used the single bead acquisition 
um, non gated scan, you know, because if, if you really don't need that detail, then there's no need to, to do all that radiation. Great, thank you. And another question so, what normal values or what reference uh, publication you use usually for, for ventricular volumes and EF in, this, in these patients? Right, so with regards to the reference, I um, to be honest, I tend to um, extrapolate from, from what I use for ECHO. Um, I know there are a couple of references out there that are not coming to mind right now, but I know there is an SCCT reference that they tend to use for the volumes. Um, but it's, it's, not just, it's not just so much for the absolute number, but you have to index it to the patient's body surface area. And then that guideline document I referenced with the ACHD management guidelines, there's actually set criteria for what the bench, the, the threshold that they use for RV um, dilation, at which point you should intervene. So it's not just the absolute number, but also the number relative to the patient's um, weight and body, body habit, BMI. Thank you so much. I think uh, this was wonderful. Just as a last question, I guess, I mean, you're, you've been doing so well and in so many different societies, like we were talking, both nuclear, real multimality imager with CT. What recommendation, I guess, you have for the fellows when they graduate about involvement in societies and what, what do you think? Yes, I think, you know, um, I always tell the fellows never stop learning, never stop evolving because, you know, I'm certainly not practicing now how I practiced, you know, back in 2010 when I finished my imaging training. So much has happened in imaging. So I think even as when you graduate from fellowship and become an attending, the key is really getting involved with your societies. And that involvement might be even as simple as, you know, there might be a call for uh, applying for a task force or even social media or early career. You know, you have to start small. You have to creep before you walk, right? So any opportunity that you um, have with, with interfacing with the committees. And there's usually there's a call for applications for committees for each of the different societies. So really looking out for that, applying, um, and also, you know, being involved with um, ACC can also be very helpful. I think there's an imaging council of the ACC. There's an early career as well, um, getting involved there. Um, you know, of course, when you're starting out, you can't do everything at once, right? You also have to make sure you build your clinical practice. So I think building a clinical practice and then as you mature, I'd say by year one, by year two, year three, trying to reach out and, and applying for these committees. And then with any opportunity that you're given is really to make the best of it and networking um, you know, with, with um, leaders in the field as well. I can speak for ASNAC, there's a leadership development program that um, you know, they, they, I think there was a call for applications maybe around this time now, so you might wanna check it out if you're interested. Um, it's a very good opportunity to really meet people that are leaders in, in, in this particular case, nuclear imaging. I think SCCT also has one. I'm not sure, Leandra, if you're a part of that, um, the leadership development with SCCT, and I think ASC as well. So um, really starting there and then building um, as you go forward um, in, in your career. Thank you so much. I'm sure all fellows listening really, really value your, your advice, and, and I do as well. So uh, this was wonderful. Great to have you here. And we'll see you at AHA, hopefully. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Take Thank care. you very much. Bye-bye.